Teresa McCabe is in the studio as well. Teresa, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. And you have brought with you a special guest. I sure have. I have brought with me our new CEO, President and CEO of WVU Medicine East, Mark O'Hearton. Mark, good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, thank you for coming in. And uh, what date were you installed as the new CEO? First of November. So this is pretty new. Pretty new, yeah. It's my first month on the gig. Yeah. How many locations are, do you become in charge of then as the new CEO? So our two inpatient facilities, Berkeley Medical Center, Jefferson Medical Center, and then we have a number of uh, ambulatory facilities throughout both counties. And um, so that's really kind of my scope in terms of what I'm very focused on right now. What is your goal and your mission now as you are in charge? So, you know, first and foremost is to really introduce myself to the community. Um, and we can get into that, certainly, if that's a, of interest to everyone, where I'm from, my background. But um, really uh, building great relationships is something over my 16, 17 year career that has been foundational mm -hmm. uh, to uh, making sure that our physicians are well cared for, listened to. Uh, help drive the mission and what we're doing. Our staff, uh, they work incredibly hard. They've worked through COVID. Uh, we've gone through staffing challenges. And so making sure that they feel appreciated, again, they feel listened to. And then focused on the nuts and bolts, focused on the operations of the, of the inpatient facility, focused on our outpatient expansion and growth. Um, I'm sure everybody has had either personally or through family members, someone who's needed to, to get care and has had challenges getting in lately over the last several years. It's been tough. Access is tough. Recruitment. So really a focus on getting to know the staff, getting to know the docs, um, really getting to know the community and introducing myself to the community as a long-term uh, person coming in and, and committed to the region. And then again, focused on our operations, making sure that we're running a, a smooth operation. We run a great patient experience when you come into the facility. It's easy to use, easy to navigate your medical record. Those are all things over my 16 years that I think have been kind of a blueprint of success. Um, but first and foremost, it's that visibility, the open door policy, making sure, because good ideas don't come from me. Generally, great ideas are coming from the staff, the physicians, the community that I get to serve. Where does medicine go next? Let's start you off with an easy question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. We're going we're gonna to start with a zinger. Yeah, so um, where, what does it evolve to? Yeah, so, you know, I think medicine over, again, over my career, um, certainly in this country, we, we are uh, all about, we need it now, we need it quickly, we need answers. And so access is incredibly important in healthcare. How we do that, how we care for patients has also changed over time. Traditionally, you know, you're driving, you know, maybe into the city or you're driving a far distance to go see specialists um, to get the care. And the goal, and I think what's happening over time is that we're meeting patients where they live. We wanna make sure that we're providing access close to home and providing better access. Just like if you go to Starbucks or you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you know, it's on every street corner or Walgreens, et cetera. And so I think figuring out the right care for the right patient at the right time in the right place and doing that with technology, doing that with advancements in the way that we collaborate, specialists collaborate with primary care physicians um, is really kind of a big focus. And then the technology is incredible, whether it's AI, whether it's the electronic re medical record and being able to actually predict healthcare events for patients before they occur, um, but also in the surgical arena, uh, how we get to precision medicine with robotics, um, how we're getting to advanced imaging and we have folks from different parts of the country or even across seas reading radiology imaging at night, et cetera. So it's just become a much more 24 seven operation. Um, and so I think that that will need to be something that continues going forward is again, bringing subspecialty here into the panhandle, making sure patients can stay in their local community to receive advanced care. Um, and ideally very close to home, ideally in proximity to where they live. Um, and certainly if they need inpatient care, we want to be able to provide all the inpatient care they might need 
um, right here at Berkeley, or certainly if you live in Jefferson County, you can go to Jefferson. If you need something a little bit more advanced, you can come to Berkeley, but you don't have to go down to Morgantown. That's ultimately the goal and the vision for the future here. I started working in Berkeley County in January of 1990. So when the calendar flips, it'll be 35 years. And at that time, there was one hospital in Berkeley County, and there were 55, 60,000 residents. And now there's 130,000 residents, and there's still one hospital in Berkeley County. Do you need a second location, or at least a smaller version of this larger location that you have now somewhere else in Berkeley County? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a month in. We'll have to see. As I, <laughs> I need answers now, as, Bill. I need answers now. <laughs> and you'll probably get them, Rob. <laughs> as, as I go through my first 100 days and assess, I mean, my, again, just going back on prior experience and prior roles uh, over my career is, um, you know, from an infrastructure, from an overhead perspective and um, managing teams and being able to provide comprehensive care. The goal would be to, you know, de demographics in healthcare. So your population, as you said, as the population ages or changes or needs different things from a healthcare perspective, we have to meet the community where they're at. And and, that, and the goal is wellness, correct? And, and trying to keep people. Sorry, I'm putting my hat, my hospice hat on now. Yeah. Keeping people out of mm -hmm. the hospital as much as possible because. I mean, without going into a whole lot of detail, you get dinged when they come back again and again and again. So while you want capacity, you also want to focus on different areas, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Prevention, primary care, and, and really outpatient, uh, really outside the four walls of the hospital. I mean, if I think back eight years ago, thinking about where our health care was provided, you know, probably 80% of the healthcare we provided was in the four walls of the hospital. That has really evolved. We're now probably closer to 60% of care is provided on the outpatient setting in, in outpatient environments. Um, and as you say, and hospice is such a critical partner in what we do is making sure that we tie in to community partners we create that bridge. If you do need to come to the ER or you need to be admitted for a couple nights to get um, to, to get to, to get improved, but then making sure that we bridge that back and we get them connected with the primary care, we get them connected with hospice if that's what they need. Um, but the demographics are strong in this community, and that's not uh, you can see it I, when I drove here today. I saw a lot of new developments and homes going up. Um, a lot of folks coming in that ultimately are going to need a lot of outpatient care and potentially some inpatient care. Well, and you alluded to eight years ago, I mean, you would go in for a procedure and you'd be in the hospital for three, four days. Now you can get a hip replaced, a knee replaced, just about anything replaced. And, and it's outpatient. I mean, you're there and you go home in the afternoon. I mean, it's pretty incredible what's yeah. evolved. So Yeah, and that, and that to your point, it just speaks to the technology uh, where we're advancing, certainly preoperatively, making sure that patients, we call it prehab instead of rehab, is prior to getting a procedure, making sure that they're uh, as healthy as possible. Because as you go into a procedure, it's like going into combat. It's like going into uh, for your body. And so you want to make sure that your body is really as tuned up as possible and ultimately postoperatively that results in a much better outcome, much quicker recovery, uh, and we've seen that play out in a number of specialties. Mark, first, welcome, and second, you're nice. getting the uh, the right way to be introduced through with Teresa. She knows everybody. She's respected by everybody, so it's a wonderful way to get to know the community. Uh, Rob asked a question, where is medical care going? Let me ask a variant of that question, a much more specific. What needs to be fixed in uh, WVU East. Mm -hmm. Well, I was told parking might come up in this conversation. <laughs> we're going to go real. One. We're going to go real simple. Um, but it, but uh, you know, it speaks to access. I think access and, frankly, coordination of care. Um, and it was talked about, you know, with hospice and other things. I think coordination. Generally, healthcare we tend to be a bit siloed. And I think the value of being part of a larger health system, and again, I came from Pittsburgh, a very large health system, learned and cut my teeth in, in that, is that through, again, through the electronic health record, through coordination of, we call them institutes at WVU, so thinking about the Heart and Vascular Institute, our Cancer Institute, et cetera, we're actually able to organize and assemble care 
in a very thoughtful way that makes sure that the multidisciplinary approach and making sure that everybody that needs to be involved and then also thinking about standardizing care. So often you get variability across providers potentially in different environments that might treat the same exact thing five different ways with very different outcomes. And so with our, again, with data and working through our service lines, we actually can develop protocols to make sure that we provide care the same way here, subspecialty care from, for example, the Heart and Vascular Institute. If you come to our Heart and Vascular Institute here, it's the same protocols and care that you're gonna get down in Morgantown and Ruby, world-class center. And then connecting that with the electronic health record, if there are ultimately things that we don't do here that we need to connect, all those records are assembled, delivered uh, instantaneously um, and provided. And so I think ultimately that's a good, very good model going forward for this country in general, is to make sure that we're coordinating care within disciplines. We're bringing everybody to the table that needs to be involved because everybody's gonna have a certain perspective on a patient. And so bringing that multidisciplinary approach, I think makes us better and ultimately improves outcomes. A subject that pops up very frequently here, and Maria and I both, uh, Maria with hospice, I'm on the board, uh, is certificate of need. And there's always a certificate of need uh, that the when the question is asked, they revert back to the hospital. And they use the fact that you can go across the river to Hagerstown and get the same care for a substantial less amount of money. There, hence, you do not, you need a certificate of need. What is your argument? What is your rebuttal to that argument? Sure, so I think certificate of need, it's certainly an, uh, a policy that is a little bit newer for me because in Pennsylvania we did not have certificate of need. But what I can say is that um, I think that it absolutely protects West Virginians. It ensures that we are able to have great care within the state so that folks don't actually have to go outside the state for care. If ultimately, you know, that certificate of need potentially were to go away, I think that would result in potentially folks leaving the area for some of their higher end care, which I don't think would be a good thing for West Virginians. I think the intent here is to make sure West Virginians can be cared for within their local community. And we have a thoughtful way of deciding what additional resources need to be put in the community for care. So evaluating a needs assessment, as opposed to, you know, we pop up 15 of these and then we've really burdened the taxpayer, we've burdened the community with a lot of extra cost that maybe was unnecessary. So I think it's a thoughtful approach. I'm learning a little bit more about the CON process. Well, part of the CON, uh, numbers are thrown out. Are there an analysis done that says that the medical care in the Eastern Panhandle is equivalent to that of what we find in the adjacent states at the comparable cost? That that I don't have an answer for yeah, you today. But I, think that's, but I think that's a great question. That's a type that's of answer. That's the right question. As CON goes down the legislative process, and it is talking to a lot of our new legislators, that is front and center in their minds. So CON CON is going to be addressed. Hospice has a I think a fairly reasonable, compelling argument. Uh, uh, to support CON. Uh, I'm not sure the hospitals do, and that's why I asked that question the way I did. I, I think this is the answer you need to come up with. So. I mean, it does have an interesting perspective, having the Pennsylvania yeah. experience, which, again, does not have CON versus West Virginia, which, yeah. which does. Maria? And so you you alluded, Mark, to the the point of how long it takes to get an appointment, and I think that's it feels like it's, um, you know, it's diminished since um, the before time, since uh, COVID. But what about that? Is that still something high on the, on your radar that, you know, I need to get, <laughs> let's have this conversation, a colonoscopy, and it's going to take me six, nine months to get in to, to, for that, to see that specialty. Person. Yeah. So, I mean, access, as I've talked about, access is incredibly important. Uh, we've hired over 90 new physicians to the area last year. We have 25 more committed this year. Um, and so this is important recruitment and the ability to bring um, these specialties into West Virginia is going to continue to be an area of focus for our team and then making sure that we deploy those specialists 
um, into the areas so that folks, again, don't have to travel and go, yeah. go elsewhere. Yeah. We just hired two uh, new GI physicians. They just started. Good to know. Um, <laughs> Dr. Gupta uh, and Dr. Hadi. Um, they both started over the last month or two. They have um, greatly improved from an access perspective. Uh, and those two uh, practices are going to be growing on the Berkeley campus. Um, and Dr. Hadi will be doing a lot of advanced therapeutic GI work. Dr. Gupta will be doing a ton of colonoscopies five days a week. Um, and I think that's, that's a tough day, man. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but he's great. Those people deserve every penny. He he. We <clears throat> we we recruited him from Michigan. He built an, a world class program up there. He's excited to build a very similar program down here for us. Um, and so, but to your point, looking at those specialties where we do have access issues, where we can't get patients to be seen, that's top priority for us. Because again, that's resulting in folks having to travel outside the area or outside the state for that care. Schools talk about the difficulty in hiring teachers because you just can't find enough to hire. Are you going through the same thing in the medical professions right now with nurses, doctors, and other skilled professionals? Text. I'd say in pockets, definitely within certain specialties. It's a little bit of a healthcare desert. It's, it's a challenge. Some of that has been a challenge. So some specialties, there might be eight, 900 open positions across the country, very difficult to compete, right? They can go wherever they'd like. Um, so a lot of this is really trying to create a great environment for our physicians when they come in, that we make sure they have a great practice, a great place to take care of patients. Um, but CRNAs is another example, chief nurse anesthetists. Um, that's a challenge. Nurses are a challenge. And so partnering with the local universities, partnering with the schools, making sure that we have a ton of student rotations within our facilities, um, even partnering with the high schools, getting to that point um, for some of our other ancillary jobs, too, to say, you know, if you want to come in and work casually over the summer or you want to work and do some part-time work and build up your resume, um, we need those individuals at the hospital. I went to Duquesne University, which you live in Pittsburgh, you're familiar with Duquesne University, yeah. and they had, I'm sure they still do a nursing school. So even at that time, the nurses who graduated, and you'd talk to them later and they would say the same thing, it's stressful, I had too many patients for the amount of time that I have to do things, and 40 years later I hear the same issue from nurses. My next door neighbor is a, is a nurse and she's worked in various nursing fields, right? What can you do to alleviate the pressure on nurses? Because there's a, it's tough to hire them and then it's tough to keep them as well. And, and the, the reason when I talk to them that they leave the job that they have is burnout. It's not salaries. They, get, they say they get compensated well. It's the burnout of just too many patients that they have to deal with. Uh, for one person to deal with it. Yeah, so it's multi, it's absolutely, as you said, it's multifactorial. And my wife's a teacher, so I, I uh, certainly appreciate the challenges that teachers have gone through. I think there are similarities, right? So class sizes, similar to the number of patients that you might have on a floor in a given shift. Um, so first and foremost is that we do need to make sure we're looking out for our nurses um, on, the, on the inpatient side. That's generally where we've seen a lot of the burnout. Um, and, and nurses moving to health, the health plan side or moving to the outpatient side of the business. Um, and so focusing on our inpatient care, focusing on our nursing ratios, making sure that not only does the nurse have these patients, but we have a nurse's aide or we have a tech with them to support. Um, and also that our providers, our physicians that are doing rounds on the floor, are taking notice and really partnering with our nurses, doing what we call dyad rounding, where they'll actually go in, they'll round the patient with the nurses. Um, but we have to focus on th this critical uh, component of our workforce. If we don't have inpatient nurses, we, we can't open beds, we, we don't have access. Um, so a huge shout out to all the nurses at WVU Medicine, Berkeley Jefferson. Um, they do an unbelievable job. They, they take great care of the patients. But I think it's a long-term issue. We have to partner with the schools. We have to get a better pipeline um, coming in and then make sure that, that that job, that we focus on what are the components that are ultimately leading to burnout for that job and I identify those barriers, try to remove those barriers. Are you still using any travel nurses, um, specifically inpatient? We are, we are less so. Certainly uh, post pandemic, we had a huge spike up. Um, I think I was looking at my notes before, we had over 180 travelers uh, in the campus, and now we're down to less than 70. 
Um, and so that's a really great improvement. We're going to get that down to probably 30, 40 this year, cut that in half again. Um, but And we thank those travelers because, frankly, they allowed us to keep the hospital open during that time. Um, but we are seeing good flowing of candidates. We've increased the number of nurses that are enrolling in the nursing schools. I think that they've had a permanent adjustment also on their compensation side post pandemic that has now acknowledged and put them where they should be in terms of um, that piece. But um, burnout, electronic medical records, simplifying that, simplifying their role on the floor, um, those are all things that we need to continue to do. We have a lot of nursing councils uh, within the facility so it's nurse driven where they come together they're looking at policies they're looking at the way they do their, their work and trying to empower them to um, kind of help inform what that needs to look like going forward mark you used a, a number earlier 20 new doctors in the last year uh that Nine, uh, 90 last year 90 25 last year. Okay, committed not, in 90, 2025 okay yep. 90 last year uh that could only be for two reasons one we are experiencing significant huge growth or there's significant turnover what is our turnover among the the doctors in, in um Turnover is low um, within the providers, so okay. I think five, five, ten percent, and that's pretty much national average. Um, so this is a lot of growth. This is a mm -hmm. lot of expansion of programs. Mm -hmm. We're launching a bariatric pro bariatric surgical program uh, this month, actually, new program. Uh, we've added a number of different general surgeons, some with certain subspecialties in terms of foregut, in terms of oncology, et cetera. Um, we've added GI, as I mentioned to you. We're yeah. adding primary care. Um, we're adding an in, uh, interventional stroke program that's going to launch in January, so more of our stroke patients can stay locally on the campus. We've added orthopedics. So this is a lot of incremental growth. Um, and again, ultimately, when we look at our zip codes and demographic, they're taking care of patients that live in Berkeley and Jefferson County. This isn't as if we're pulling in. This is just taking care of our own. Um, and that's really focus number one is let's right size let's make sure that we have the right resources here the right number of providers in the right population growth centers as i'm coming in and seeing all these population centers that are starting to grow we have to make sure that we meet those individuals where they live and be able to provide a lot of comprehensive outpatient so they don't have to travel in they don't have to deal with the parking issues um, that that persist that we are going to fix um, <laughs> But, but yeah, a lot of growth incrementally, not as much turnover, knock on wood, and we're going to keep focused on yeah. that. Only what? 60 seconds left, Bill. I've got to cut the questioning off right now. But it's a good question. I'm right? sure it was the best one you've ever going to <laughs> It's uh, always a good question. Teresa, was there anything you needed to promote event-wise coming up? Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, introduce Mark to you guys and to Thank the you. community, and I think he's done a fine Thank job you. here today. And, Thanks, and from a marketing standpoint, he's a wonderful pr president and CEO, um, as you can see, very personable. And well, you certainly have to say that, Teresa, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, thank you for coming in. Appreciate it. Man. Great to be with you guys today. Thank, thank you. you so much. Mark O'Hearn, new CEO of WV Medicine East here in the Eastern Panhandle as we...